Hello Memory Forensics fans, I'm Kevin Ripa and this is My Sans 3 Minutes Max. In the last episode we laid the groundwork to show you how a mistake can be made when it comes to deleted files and deleted MFT entries and uh, drawing the wrong conclusions. So this is where we left off at and uh, let's take this one step further now that we know how the MFT goes to the storage space. So we start to see where mistakes here and incorrect conclusions can possibly occur. In this example, the user deleted the mschat.dll now. As a result, MFT record 2 gets marked as deleted, which causes at least cluster 13 to become available for new data if the computer chooses to do so. At a later time, with no correlation to the previous deletion, a user creates a new file called koala.jpg. The file metadata occupies MFT record number 3 and the file itself exists starting at cluster 13, completely overwriting the old file of mschat.dll that used to live here. Now let's see what happens in a typical forensic exam with a typical forensic tool. One of the early functions as performed in an exam is for the tool to crawl the MFT and show the artifacts, including from MFT entries that no longer are in use, or like for deleted files. In this exam, we're trying to find evidence of koala pictures with a mind to trying to figure out how they got there. This can occur in more than one way and is fraught with mistakes if the examiner doesn't know what they're looking for. If the forensic tool crawls through the MFT looking for JPEG extensions and mapping them as a means to show a picture in the gallery, this wouldn't by itself be a necessarily bad thing. However, if the forensic tool is going through the MFT and correlating the actual file being referred to along with its header information, this is where the problem occurs because each MFT entry is mapped to the cluster it refers to. As can be seen here, the forensic program crawled the, crawled the MFT and presented anything that looked like a picture to the examiner. As it crawled the MFT, it saw that entry number two, even though labeled as a deleted mschat.dll file, actually pointed to a picture, so the picture was presented in gallery view. As a result, the resident picture at cluster 13 would look to an untrained or improperly trained examiner as though it were named mschat.dll. Now the examiner, holding someone's future in their hands, is attempting to allege that the person is hiding pictures by renaming them as a Windows system file and burying them deep into the operating system. This shows awareness of the artifact, not to mention intent. Nothing could be further from the truth. Let's take this one step further. What if the MFT entry number three and its corresponding file, the actual uh, koala.jpg, had actually gotten there as a result of a web cache entry? Then after the requisite passage of time, the system deleted the koala.jpg file. And then nothing had overwritten the koala.jpg file, however MFT entry number 3 had later been reassigned to a new file called checklist.xlsx. Now the koala picture still exists on cluster 13, however the only reference to cluster 13 exists in MFT entry number 2. Now you're left with an MFT entry and a cluster in the hard drive storage space that seem to somehow belong to each other but have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Let's add another layer of complexity. What if somebody bought this computer used on Craigslist or eBay or simply from some else such as a previous return from a major electronics store. The hard drive was never wiped but simply returned to factory settings. That remnant of web activity is still living in unallocated file space and still being referred to from a deleted MFT entry that has no association to it. All of this to say you better know what you're doing when you come across this. What you do matters. In the meantime and in between time that's it another episode of 3 Minutes Max.